Uh, hello, my name is Atamart. I've been uh, learning closure since 2013. And uh, this, this is a lightweight talk, relatively. I have very few code examples, only just one free graph. I'll uh, try to make it count. Um, initially, my interest in uh, the SS enclosure started when I was trying to, not trying, actually, I did implement it. Uh, I was working on a uh, functional relational programming environment. Have you heard of out of the tarpit? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So I, I written the language part uh, in, in, a, in a Lisp dialect, very simple Lisp dialect. And then uh, parsing and uh, evaluating was done in uh, closure in the initial uh, prototype. So what, what would be the use case for uh, it using a DSL? After all, DSL is just an abstraction, right? Uh, I have two use cases uh, that I think are most important, but we can discuss after the talk uh, if you think otherwise. We think there are other more important cases. The first one is um, about what, what we are saying, about uh, how, we are, how we are expressing the problem we are currently trying to solve. And uh, when doing that, speaking a common language, uh, by common I mean uh, there are two sides of every program, right? There are the, the insides of the program, uh, the, the the, the white box sort of thing, and then there are the consumers of the program and what they understand and what they want the program to do. So uh, th this, this way, uh, speaking the same language, by that I mean uh, expressing the problem uh, to the uh, uh, system inside. And of course, uh, just speaking, only just speaking the same language is not enough. Uh, we have to be able to uh, completely express the problem. So we use the, uh, we use the SL abstractions to uh, state the problem we are trying to solve and uh, state it explicitly and correctly. And I think that is one difference uh, for, of DSLs uh, from other kinds of, I'd say, lighter weight, smaller abstractions, like types, classes, records, enclosure. Uh, protocols enclosure. And the, uh, no need to read this. Uh, <laughs> this is from, uh, this is a philosophical, uh, this is in the philosophical concept. This is about concept forming in real life. And there are two parts to this. And I think there are uh, parallels to designing DSLs uh, with this. Uh, the first part is about how we, uh, take the similarities of existence of things uh, when forming a concept while uh, leaving out some of their differences. So we, we, we take the similarities in, we leave out the differences, and we call this new construct a concept. And the second part is about how concepts that are uh, in, another, in other concepts uh, are differentiated between each other, uh, meaning that a concept can have, maybe, maybe it doesn't have any existence, maybe it has only concepts, because concepts also form a hierarchy. And uh, within that kind of con concept, the sub-concepts, ha we have to be able to differentiate them somehow, and the second part is about that. To illustrate, we have existence, right? Three tables. Uh, we, all, we all immediately recognize that they are tables. Uh, but we also know them collectively as the concept table. When I say table, you don't think I, I refer to a specific particular table. So this is, this is about the first part. And then when we form the concept of table, we, we take the similarities. A table is something that, that is lifted from the ground that we can put things on, right? Same thing, chairs, and they, they collectively form, of course, Chair concept doesn't include only these three particular chairs. All the chairs uh, get inside that concept. And the same thing is for couches. And 
tables, chairs, couches. We can take these three concepts. We can put them all together and call them collectively furniture. So, so we here, uh, we form the higher level abstraction here. The first abstraction was from the existence and the second one was higher level. And within this abstraction, we can still see the differences of different types of objects. They, they are not completely melded into something else. They still retain their identity. The second use case I came up is, uh, like all other abstractions, we use them to hide details. And similarly, if I go back, but when I say furniture, I mean a lot of things, but I say only one word. So I, I've hidden a lot of things. Maybe you can say there's, there's some, some ambiguity, there's some vagueness, but actually if I'm actually talking about furniture, that's exactly what I should be saying, right? So two use cases, uh, speaking the same language, uh, effectively stating our problem, and the second one is the uh, to hide implementation details. These were my use cases. And this is my tree graph, only I have, I have this. Uh, obviously, this is, this is not a binary tree. Uh, the interesting, this is slightly interesting for me. If I take the leaves of this tree and replace them with symbols, yes, this is actually about closure, by the way, uh, not just Ayn Rand. Uh, if I replace it with uh, symbols, because Closure is a symbolic language, right? That's, that's actually a very uh, important differentiator of closure than pretty much every other popular language. Uh, and this is, this is the code we write. And internally, it, is, it, is, it can be represented as a tree. You can, you can look at the parentheses, so many parentheses. And then actually, if you're, if you're used to writing closure code, you will start seeing actually trees you will start seeing forms. And because of this simple representation, Clojure is, is very uh, suitable language for building DSLs. Uh, maybe suitable is not a good word, but uh, it's easier, I would say, it's easier to build embedded DSLs in Clojure than uh, pretty much any other language. Because we can change the, the syntax, we can play with the syntax, we can use We can use macros to uh, sort of uh, replace the code at compile time, even though there's not really a compile time for closure. Uh, or at runtime, we can still accept forms, uh, quoted forms, and we can, we can play with them. It, it doesn't even have to be the, the form at runtime or compile time. The form we accept doesn't even have to be valid code. It can be anything. I uh, categorize uh, DSLs as independent and embedded. Uh, th this is more about embedded DSLs, uh, but the difference between them is basically uh, embedded DSL sort of extends the host language. It's, it's within the host environment and extends the host language. And the host language, host environment can be fully available, or it may be partially available. For example, uh, you can have a macro that accepts some arbitrary code, but within that code, you may disallow certain structs and you can, you can remove them, right? Uh, but the, the example I will give later, actually uh, all the closure is available. And then independent DSL is outside of the environment. It, it's, it's in a way it's above the environment or it's executed uh, outside of the environment itself. So you have full control of what to allow and what to disallow and what to expose to your DSL. Uh, but it's, it's actually more work, especially if you have a very uh, flexible language like Clojure, it's, it's more work to build an independent uh, DSL. Uh, but another advantage of independent DSLs is, is if you have your language, your own language, you can uh, replace the implementation language, and uh, nobody even has to know. So before we move on to the embedded case, 
Uh, this is an example written with Instaparse. Oh, I'm so surprised. It always has shown the uh, horizontal score bar here. Awesome. This was my Lisp dialects uh, grammar. Anybody has worked with Instaparse? So, so somewhat familiar, right? So basically, let's, take, let's just take a look at this. This is, this is an application, open parent, and we have a closed parent, and in between we have any number of, uh, it can be white space or atom or list or another application. By the way, just again, just only looking at the application itself, uh, when Instaparse does its job, all I have is uh, AST. Because uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be valid my language. It, it doesn't have a name, actually. It doesn't have to be valid. So this is the first part. I get the AST. I still have to validate it, and then I still have to uh, evaluate it afterwards. So the main, main subject of this talk is this little shape language. It's a very, very, very simple language. It, in real world, I suppose it would have m many more uh, bells and whistles, but this is very simple. And my inspiration comes from this paper. In this paper, uh, they are given a uh, some sort of defense uh, program prototype uh, to the participants, and they they use different different languages to write a prototype. And uh, there are some interesting findings about uh, how Haskell ends up uh, producing less bugs and in less lines of code, etc., etc., and and good performance. So basically, according to this paper. Haskell uh, is much better than C++ in, in, every, in every way, as far as I remember. So this is, this is, a, this is a, a graphic I stole from the paper itself. Uh, they define these shapes, and then they, they define, on top of this language, they define rules of en engagement. Like this may be a ship, maybe and it's going this way, and maybe this is a plane uh, flying like this, and then can this ship uh, shoot down this plane? Things like that. Uh, in my language, it, it, is, it will be, because I think I have something like 15 minutes or so, uh, it's very, very, very simple. We will have uh, points, circles, and very simple transformations, and very simple combinations. Uh, this is quite complex, actually. Yes. So we will have the ability to describe simple shapes and uh, compound shapes uh, formed, formed by combining simple shapes. And we will, we will be able to define points. And the, the only purpose of this language is to check whether a point is inside a given shape or not. This function, inside function, takes a shape, takes a point, returns Boolean. This is uh, from structure and interpretation of computer programs. Uh, I'm guessing some of us are also familiar with this. Uh, there, Abelson and Sussman says, to understand the language, you need to ask three questions. What are the primitives of the language? Uh, what are the means of combination? And what are the means of abstraction? So let's take a look. Uh, I have two primitives. Uh, circle shapes and points. Very simple. X and Y coordinates. And this one, this one is, this is a function, of course. This one is a, a value. It, it uh, represents a unit circle. A circle centered at origin with the radius of 1. The means of combination is, so basically all the combinatory functions they, they only operate on circles. I said this is a very simplified thing. No, some of them also operate on points. Anyway, uh, they take a shape and they return a shape. Uh, translate moves shapes and uh, scale basically scales them. And uh, if, I, if I added uh, things like rectangles or triangles or more complex polygon shapes, etc., etc. I would have to add rotate, and think things would get uh, exponentially complex. So I just kept it simple. Uh, by the way, the code and tests are uh, online right now. After 
after this you can take a look. The, the second set of combination functions, they take multiple shapes and return a single shape. They, you can build a union of shapes or you can build an intersection of shapes. And actually, by, just by, you, you only need to supply two. Uh, union and intersection, union uh, and difference, or intersection and difference. No, not the last one. Uh, you only need to supply two functions. Based on these, you can also uh, derive a difference, for example. Means of abstraction. Since this is an embedded DSL, uh, there is nothing further that I, I have uh, written. Uh, you can use the entire closure. How to think, well, well, let's, say, let's say we have decided, uh, we are confident and we really need a DSL, nothing else will solve our problem. Uh, how to think, how to start designing the DSL itself. I have uh, uh, three guidelines for this. I would suggest thinking outside in, or top down, if you will. I would suggest following the closure principle. And uh, okay, syntactic sugar, is not a goal in and of itself, but like uh, ease of use, let's say ease of use, the third one is. <coughs> By outside in thinking, I mean, uh, I suggest starting uh, thinking the, the interface, the consumers of the DSL, the users of the DSL will use instead of the internal details. Uh, as, as little internal details as possible we should expose to the outside world and give them like a clean uh, interface and small interface as much as possible. Uh, let me show you this again. So we have a point function, we have a, a value origin and we use the same value with another value circle, unit circle. And uh, <coughs> Our functions, uh, our functions are directly inside this protocol. But hopefully, uh, if I if I didn't overlook something, uh, you can just import these as normal closure functions, and you can just use them. The consumers uh, they don't need to know that this is a protocol. And points implementation of this protocol is here. Let's just take a look at translate. Basically, I I uh, I get the uh, uh, deltas, I add the dx to x, add uh, dy to y, and the indentation is wrong. Anyway, I build a new point. Closure principle is uh, our means of abstraction, if they uh, result in the language's own primitives and not something else, uh, that means we are uh, adhering the principle of closure. Because otherwise, if I combine things and I end up with something that is not usable by my language itself, uh, then it's, it's useless from my language's perspective. So as much as possible, we want to, uh, our, our combinations to end up uh, other primitives. Let's say, let's move, a, a certain, let's move the unit circle and scale it. We can do it like this. We first scale and then move. Uh, and then we can check that the origin is actually inside this new circle. It should return true. Uh, by the way, means of abstraction, I can just make some small changes. I can make this definite and I can change this with variables. I can, I can build a circle building function. So building uh, abstractions uh, is easy actually. And the syntactic sugar, I already mentioned this. Uh, this is an internal detail. My users, I don't want my users to know there is such a thing as a, as a record or there is such a thing as a protocol or what is the name of the protocol. I just want them to uh, understand and use points and circles and uh, translate, etc. If if I if closure was better at hiding things, I would hide it even further. But and this is another exa example. Uh, this is from test check. Uh, are you familiar with test check? It's, it does generative testing. 
so to explain this real quick, we want to generate a random list of bytes in this case. Generate a random list, give me that list, but along with this list also give me one of the elements in the list. The element you give me, I want it to be uh, guaranteed to be inside the list. So it returns a tuple, uh, one of this, this generator returns a single element of this, and then this, this is basically just returning the list as is. So I'm using bind. And I, I, I use two generators, but the second generator depends on the first generator in this case. And test check has a, a syntactic sugar for this. You can write it with the uh, let macro. As you see, I first generate my list, this line, and then I, I pick one of the elements, and then I return a list. And this, this, is, this is much much more readable, I think. And basically what happens is, let macro converts this code into pretty much this code. But the advantage is, okay, maybe for two things, it doesn't look very interesting, but if you have 10 things, uh, good luck writing uh, 10 binds inside each other. It's not easy. So, <coughs> we, we define the primitives. We have the uh, means of composure, uh, and we are, we are adhering to uh, the closure principle. And we have a ni nice language now. Like, let's say the uh, external API is somewhat stable now. Now, without changing the external API, we can improve the internal API. And maybe, maybe this is one of the advantages of using a DSL. We can, uh, suppose we have two circles. The, one of them is inside another one. We can replace a union of these two circles with the larger circle. Because there's, there's no need to compute. There's only to go, OK, uh, am I in this, circ in this circle? Yes, OK, then check the next one. No need. If it's in the larger circle, it's also in this. Sorry. Yes, I it's either, right? If it's in the larger circle, we don't need to check the second one. Uh, second optimization we can do is, again, we can take a, uh, a complex form without evaluating it first. And then we can uh, transform unnecessary, uh, we can eliminate unnecessary transformation. If I'm moving something this way, and then I'm moving it back in this original place, I can just remove both uh, transforms, both translates. And the ultimate elimination is I can use uh, uh, transformation matrix. If, if your language is two dimensional, you need a three times three matrix. And then you can, within this matrix, you can encode uh, translation, rotation, uh, scaling, uh, shearing, everything you can encode in this matrix. And, and change your language uh, without uh, changing its API. And uh, that's all I have. Uh, questions? So, uh, uh, at your uh, example implementation, did you use the insert pass to, to, to pass uh, the real code or you just uh, use the, uh, the code? Uh, you're, you're familiar with uh, Tarpit, right? Tarpit paper. Not, not, not very familiar. So it's like a, it's kind of like a database and a programming environment all, all uh, inside each other. I will say it's like stored procedures, kind of, but not horrible like that. Uh, the language itself is, is purely descriptive. It has descriptions of relations, descriptions of uh, queries, descriptions of functions, etc. descriptions of uh, uh, constraints on your data, like unique constraints. This is the language, and uh, there, are, there are absolutely no effects in that language. So I, I parse this language, and based on that, I, I get the schema for my data, and I validate my schema 
with my store. Uh, and, I, and I built the functions. But the closure prototype, it's easy uh, to build the functions. It's, it's just transformation from my very restrictive uh, uh, expressions to closure. Uh, and then in this system, the, the, the system sits in the, in, in the uh, center. And then you start feeding data. And then there are observers. They subscribe to particular queries. And then data that touches, that changes the results of those queries change. The observers are waking up, and then they get the updates. So in, in, in many applications, like we read some data, we do something, we write it back, right? But in this case, it, it completely decouples the reader side and the writer side. And in the, in the middle, uh, because you uh, strongly uh, specify your schema, uh, it doesn't allow you to uh, uh, do, do things that, that violate your schema. So the, the language part is not very heavy. But the, the, the writing and uh, reading the data is, is a bit tricky. So you got another abstraction. Uh, about this uh, closure, just, just uh, uh, yes. Because if if I if, okay, if I accept, if I, you can also read a CLG CLJ file, right? You can read it, and then I, I think the function's name is read or eval, one of them. You can just read and execute arbitrary closure code within your program, just by giving the file. But then then the entire closure language is available, and the a user is allowed to do anything with your data, allowed to uh, uh, violate the constraints, ex example. That's, so so con to constrain that, I had to use a special language. Uh, okay. It's, it's a crippled. You do some sets, uh, like sandbox. Like there's uh, actually a very well known uh, library, it's a code geo. It's can, can sandbox your, your that, that way you can still can. Another, another, another thing I had to build myself is uh, the, the schema is typed. Types are very simple, but it, it is typed. And it is typed in a way, uh, this is, by the way, uh, this is relation, relational algebra. It's in, an implementation of relational algebra. And in a, let's say, when you're creating a SQL table, you say this column, this type, this column, this type. And then sometimes when you re read the schema back, it may come in a different order. But actually, uh, it stores those columns in a particular order internally. It's, it's exactly like its layout is like an Excel sheet in a database. But in relational algebra, there has to be uh, no order of the uh, tables. And the underlying system should be allowed to optimize uh, taking advantage that the uh, fields are not ordered. So I, what I had to do was I had to create a product type that is not positional. If, if you're uh, familiar with Haskell, you can have like my type ABC, right? And then A always comes from B, comes before B, B always comes before C. So it's, it's positional. You, you have the product type, but it's always positional. You cannot say, OK, my type takes three things, but in any order. You, you can never do that in the type system. So I had to uh, build that as well. No, thank you very much. No problem. Uh, my question is uh, two questions, actually. I, I have any other important use cases uh, for DSLs can you think of? Because uh, it, I'm not a DSL guy, and I think many times you can solve your problems not writing a DSL. And so are there any strong arguments to build a DSL is my question. And the second question is, um, uh, uh, second question is, again, something I'm not entirely sure. Yes. OK, 
can you think of any anything anything else about the design of uh, DSLs? Any opinions? Because none of this is really uh, mind bending. Like it's not. We used to already cover it properly, but I've used DSLs before for security in terms of receiving input from users to describe a problem and then running it in the cloud on a shared system. Uh, and the sandboxes could achieve the same thing. That's they could you can guarantee the time they could run it. So this was a performance critical environment. So DSLs you can like guarantee that there's no looping. Uh, there's nothing that can run for a long time. So you can make hard performance guarantees about how long a problem will take to run, that makes sense? I've never used a sandbox in Clojure, but yeah. uh, when, when I have a simple DSL, really simple DSL, I, I can explain this to somebody maybe less technical, I think easier than the entire Clojure, right? Sure. Also, also, if you have practical experience, is it like more work to write Sandbox closure or less work or same amount of work? Uh, I think it's similar, but I mean, yeah, yeah we, we use instant files. So it's like a seamless experience. Yeah, yeah. Also. But we use uh, instant files and then we create the SD and we read that. So it limits the amount of keywords or kind of expressions you can use. So you don't have, oh. words, you don't have uh, other dangerous constructs. Yeah. Okay. To the scope of so so you, you parse. Closure like code in Insta, Insta parse yeah. and then pass it to sandbox. Closure like in the sense that list is very easy to pass. Yeah. Rather than inventing a better syntax. <laughs> yeah, and everyone knows if you say list, list like uh, our users know what list is. So. But coming up coming up with this uh, coming up with this for me was where is it? Coming up with this for me was quite challenging. Even though this is like maybe uh, one percent of the complexity of closure, it's very, very, very simple. It's a lot easier than hand rolling out a state file. Sure. Yeah, so it's a lot, more, and it's a lot more reliable. It's fully defined grammar, so it will handle all the variations. Yeah. I think so. It's fast works well. It can be a bit slow in my experience, but if you want to run parse things at runtime. Uh, also, there is no streaming. <coughs> there is no streaming. Uh, Instaparse cannot stream data. Right. Uh, or you cannot stream data through Instaparse. Yeah. Yeah, it's one pause. Okay, thank you very much.